Welcome to Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. And we start today's episode with a song sung by Helen Peters called A Place in This World. I've spent my life waiting, hoping this might be the day. I find the thing that completes me and takes me out of the rain. Cause every day I'm seeing people succeeding and chasing their dreams. And I think, what the hell? I should as well. So here I am asking you, please throw me a line, something to hold. Chances you wouldn't be told, but I have grown. No more missing my cues. I will not be the girl sat alone with a cat in a life that she doesn't own. Can this small town girl find her place in this world? I have no love at all Selfishness, jealousy, cheating Afraid to commit I admit it's hard not to stall And fall apart at every hurdle But I stumble towards something new A dangerous man Who somehow can Make my heart crumble on cue So here I am now Wanting my child Welcome to Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits, the person behind the as-yet-unmade television programmes Help I'm Thos Ribbits Get Me Out of Here, The Only Way is Thotics, and the egotistical Thos Has Got Talent. And welcome to this, an episode of Contrasts, I think. Sadness and happiness, the past and the future all together in one. And the sadness, of course, being that this week it was announced that an old friend of this programme, the very talented, the legendary in fact, Marnie Nixon, had passed away at the age of 86. Now, Marnie Nixon was interviewed by this programme in 2010 in a truly in-depth interview, and I'll be sharing some of my memories of recording with her and that interview later on. But first, something happier, and something forward-looking, but also perhaps backward-looking. That song that we heard at the beginning of the programme. As I said, it was called A Place in This World, a demo recording sung by Helen Peters, which is part of a song showcase which is going to be in London as part of the Camden Fringe. And the musical it came from, well, that's Wags, the musical. Yes, Wags. Now, listeners with long memories and short tempers will recall that there was a musical called Wag, singular, the musical which was performed several times in London a few years ago and had a short stay at the Charing Cross Theatre. It's true to say that that musical was not tremendously well received by newspaper reviewers, although it's fair to say that criticism was not universal. 
I went to see it at the Charing Cross Theatre, and although I thought the book needed some work, it certainly wasn't the worst show I've ever seen. In fact, once you got into the spirit of it, it was quite a jolly piece. It was raucous, it was ebullient, it was certainly rude in places, but once you got used to the tone, then actually there was quite a lot to enjoy, including the score. And at least a few of the critics at the time were able to differentiate the book from the score, and there was some praise for the songs which were by Grant Martin and Tom Guyron Towers, who wrote Newland, one of my favourite shows in Edinburgh a few years ago. Well, WAG, the musical, has metamorphosed into WAGS, and that's with an exclamation mark, as you might expect, the musical, which seems to be a revised version of that original show. With music and lyrics still by Grant Martin and Tom Guyron Towers, they've been joined by Tony Bayliss on that particular aspect of the production, and the book is now by T. L. Shannon. But most importantly, it's the score which is being showcased at the Camden Fringe this year. And you can see it between the 10th and the 14th of August at 7.30 in the evening at the Hen and Chickens Theatre Bar, which is right opposite Highbury and Islington Station on the Victoria Line on the London Underground. But the address 109 St Paul's Road, postcode N12NA. And here's the blurb. A cast led by the West End's Martin Neely of Les Miserables and Starlight Express proudly showcase a concert of cutting-edge contemporary songs from this electrifying new musical comedy ahead of a UK tour. With nods to Legally Blonde and Andrew Lipper, this energetic pop and jazz-infused score stands on its own, dripping with toe-tapping, harmony-rich melodies, establishing the show's emerging British composers as vibrant new voices on the scene. The advertising then goes on to explain more about the plot. It's the product launch from an internationally renowned WAG, taking place at the city's most exclusive department store. Jenny, an ambitious designer yet mistress to a Premier League superstar, and Sharon, her unlucky in love colleague, spearhead the event. Together they encounter all from the aspiring plain Jane to the entertaining entourage of WAGs, all under the watchful eye of a crooked store manager. Satirical, heartfelt and supported by full orchestrated arrangements, this is the gift-wrapped score from WAGS, a show for and of our times. A treat for the casual enthusiast, a must-see for supporters of new musical theatre. If you didn't get a chance to see WAG the musical, or you fancy seeing how a show can develop, then go along to see WAGS, the song showcase, at the Camden Fringe this year. For more details, go to www.wagsthemusical.com. And if you want to refresh your memories of what WAG was like, you can go back to episode 381 of Musical Talk to hear my conversation with Grant Martin and Thomas Guyron Towers about that show and indeed the development of Newland, which I still think is a fantastic piece. And I'd love to see that go on a UK tour. So that's WAGs, or very nearly, or should I say Martin Neely, because we're going to hear one more song from that score, sung by Martin Neely, and it's called Cooking the Books. We're in an age of targets, goals and high objectives To keep ahead one's forced to mount a sneak attack I'm three grand overdue But move the why, carrying the ten Brings fortune into view Just add a note And once again I'm three grand in the black Excellent Cooking the books Frank A decimal here makes a profit appear Who's the wiser? Make them all look Frank At the entrepreneur Causing a stir on the scene They all mistook Frank but how I shock at shifting the stock With earnings that border obscene For crying out loud, I'm hardly proud But one must stand out from the crowd By fudging the facts Frank, a positive spin Ensures that you win admiration Be calm and relaxed Frank, ahead of the fools Who play by the rules every day Divide and subtract Frank Take a receipt and then take a seat at your show which blows them away. Just don't let the guilt destroy what you built. Keeping your conscience at bay and loading the dice. 
frank Promoting a sale on stock that is stale is my ideal Hiking the price, frank And charging a fee on free merchandise is a steal Miss Thestaniki, a pleasure Yes, the TV crew will be here And all is on track In person <laughs> I and the store are honoured Hello? And suddenly I sense a change in fate's direction There's no pretense the gods are smiling over me Deceit can bring reward But nothing untoward Merely deserving for serving the powers that be For years faithfully Oh! Fucking the books! Frank gets you a portion Sets you on course for Sardinia a star on the rise, a champagne on ice for a year You're not a crook, Frank Merely a soul achieving its goal A trailblazing rogue pioneer Lies get you ahead The truth gets you dead Loving the life that I've led I'm hooked Cooking the books well, as I said at the top of this programme, the sad news has just reached us that Marnie Nixon has died at the age of 86. Marnie Nixon is someone who perhaps should never have become famous, and there were certainly attempts to make sure that she never did, because she is now most remembered for being the ghostess with the mostess, as one newspaper wag, that's a very different kind of wag, by the way, dubbed her some years ago, as the most known of that unknown breed of singer in Hollywood films, the ghost singer. And by ghost singer, I mean someone who dubs other performers, usually, but not always, because those other performers are not quite up to hitting some of the notes, or sometimes because they simply can't sing. But very often, at least until recently, getting no credit at all, getting no royalties at all, and often being threatened that if the news were to become public that they were dubbing for the famous, more bankable Hollywood movie star who was being dubbed, then their careers would be over in Hollywood. However, Marnie Nixon is literally the voice of them all. The three films for which she's most famous for overdubbing other performers were The King and I, where she sang the voice of Deborah Carr, My Fair Lady, where she dubbed Audrey Hepburn, and of course West Side Story, where she dubbed Natalie Wood and also, briefly, Cheetah Rivera. But in her career, she dubbed many, many more, starting with The Secret Garden, a film from 1949, where she sang a Hindu lullaby, dubbing the voice of Maureen O'Brien. But I think it would be fair to say that actually Marnie Nixon was a remarkable performer in her own right, and had a much wider versatility than just dubbing as a film ghost, although that is the thing for which she is most famous. She was a classically trained singer, and she was also a singing teacher. She appeared on Broadway in a number of roles. She appeared in other films in a number of roles. You can see her singing as one of the nuns in The Sound of Music, for example. And she's one of the geese in the rather wonderful supercalifragilisticexpialidocious sequence in Mary Poppins. But I think the true breadth of her career is revealed when you look at her recording career. If you go to her website, she's very helpfully listed a discography of her recordings, and you can see that over the years she's recorded albums featuring the songs of George Gershwin, Jerome Kern, Aaron Copeland, Debussy and Foray, Arnold Schoenberg and Stravinsky. But that's not all. She also worked with Liberace and Victor Borger. She features on the cast recordings and recorded scores of Taking My Turn, Jack and the Beanstalk, Hansel and Gretel, and a complete album of Mary Poppins, where she sings all the songs originally sung by the character Mary Poppins. She's also on the Mulan recording, and rather amazingly, and this really does show her versatility and breadth, an album called Magoo in Hi-Fi, which appears to be an album featuring the character Mr Magoo, who was very big in the 1960s. Now, I had the pleasure of talking over the telephone with Marnie Nixon in 2010. She'd just turned 80 years old and was still hugely active. She didn't retire until a few years later. 
And indeed, during the course of our conversation, she had to break off briefly to talk to a student because she was still acting as a teacher, a singing teacher. And she had a one-woman show on the go at the time. In order to prepare for the interview, I'd read her autobiography called I Could Have Sung All Night. Now, the irony of that is that it was partly ghost-written for her with another writer. But, being the woman that she was, she made it absolutely plain and made sure that that other writer, Stephen Cole, was given full credit on the front page and inside. No hypocrite Marnie Nixon. For me, I was very excited at the prospect of speaking to someone who was genuinely a Hollywood legend. My good friend and colleague Tim Saywood acted as sound engineer that day, and he described me as starstruck. I'm not sure I would have described myself in that way, but I was excited. I was also deeply respectful to talk to someone who had worked on the film of My Fair Lady, on the film of West Side Story, and The King and I, and Mary Poppins. That's someone quite special. And my recollection was a woman full of energy, even at 80 years old. She was enthusiastic, she was very friendly, she couldn't have been more generous with her time, and we went on to have a wonderful in-depth conversation. And I was very keen to make sure that she understood that I wanted to speak to her not just for her career as a dubber, as a ghost singer in Hollywood, but also because of her wide versatility and broader career. And in the interview, I made a point of talking to her about her classical career and also her stage career. She had also had a long television career. She was a presenter of a children's television programme called Boomerang in America for many years, which was extremely well received by the critics and won many awards. So she was a woman of many parts, and I'm very sad to hear that she has subsequently passed away. Now, it was my intention to revisit that interview with her and edit it down in order to make a tribute programme. But as I was listening to it, I found myself constantly interested. It was almost impossible to work out what to take out. And so I thought to myself, well, it has been over six years since we broadcasted. So, slightly re-edited, but not very much, here, over the remainder of this programme, and next week, we'll hear that complete interview again, which I hope, more than anything else, will really allow Marnie Nixon to speak for herself. Something that she was gloriously able to do over the course of her career, which is all the more amazing when you consider that there were people who told her that she couldn't and that she shouldn't, and that she wouldn't. Let's hear the first part of that interview with the legendary, wonderful, and already much-missed Marnie Nixon. Musical talk. It's a, a huge pleasure to be able to speak to Marnie Nixon. So, Marnie, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Musical Talk. You're a woman who is, if I may say, in your own right, a legend. I don't want to bandy that word around, but it's certainly true. Thank you. <laughs> but w what I really wanted to uh, say is that actually your career is... You may be known for small numbers of things, but actually I think your career is extremely extensive. And there seem to be three major branches. Opera singing, uh, which has been a, a lifelong career for you, which is in tandem with your um, musical theatre career, if you like. And then you had the third career of um, your involvement in film, which has been on, well, pretty much at every level. So I wonder if we might touch, if, if you're happy, let's start with your opera career. OK. Now, I believe you discovered at the age of 11, really, that you were a coloratura, a coloratura soprano. How, how does one discover that at 11, and so how, how do you think that has sort of affected the rest of your life? Well, I was playing the violin since I was four years old, and we had a family orchestra at home. And my sisters and I eventually realised that we needed to do something to to make our lesson money back. So we began to singing together, and my mother made arrangements, and we, we got so that we could si sing and harmonize various things, and then we, could, we would have little musicals in our home on Sunday afternoons. We would invite people over, and then we'd also stand up and sing together, and then we started doing this at the... Kiwanis clubs and PTA meetings at the school to 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 uh, entertain the school people and their meetings, and uh, then they would pay us a little bit something, and so that gradually got into the fact that I just really I loved singing more than my violin, 
And then I, st- uh, I really got some nice voice lessons from various people who offered their services sometimes and or gave me a limited scholarship. And, and so then I gradually gave up my violin and started singing then. And you have perfect pitch, I believe, which has held you in very good stead for the, your entire career. Yes, that's, it, it always helps. <laughs> Especially I was doing a lot of contemporary singing at, at first, and, uh, and I found that I could, because I was a musician and, uh, and had you know, played, played an instrument, I could read anything, and then uh, because I had perfect pitch, it was even better. I, I sometimes got assignments that were really way beyond me as far as the vocal weight, but they could always trust that I was singing the right notes, and that, that helps a composer. <laughs> it also helps you as a performer, if I may say. <laughs> and of course, forgive me, I think your first show was 1941, um, Overture to Freedom, is that right? Oh, that's right. Yes, I was, uh, what was I, 41? I was uh, probably just at turn 11, and I played my uh, violin and did a little, I guess they, I've forgotten what kind of a script it was, but um, it was a show that was supposed to be going to Broadway, and then, of course, the war hit and everything, and all the plans went down the drain. But it, in the meantime, I had a little taste of, singing with an audience and trying to get people down there to see me and my mother was of course trying to get me a movie contract and was trying to really promote me in her own way so I felt like I was being professionally handled you know and felt like I was on the right track and really decided that I was going to become a singer rather than a, than a violinist. Did you at that stage think, I mean, did you make the differentiation between being an opera singer and being a singer of, say, more popular songs or Broadway songs, or was the, the world still open to you in, in all possibilities at that stage, would you say? Well, I, I think I didn't distinguish between opera and concert. I was always doing um, lighter songs that, of course, were in English, but I never listened to popular music when I was a kid. I mean, I, tr- I wanted to, but my mother would forbid me to. She, she didn't think that that was, that was something that I should waste my time on, <laughs> which, of course, it made me all the more curious and all the more like a little rebel, you know, and there would sneak things on the side. And, and here this gradually when I got into high school and things, of course, and we had, we had Benny Goodman and people like that. I was going to say, you ended up working in both streams, as it were. So, um, But opera seemed to be the first calling, is that right? Yes, definitely. And uh, I used to do a lot of uh, chamber music, too. I mean, it was, it was really chamber ensemble singing. And I was part of the... the uh, when I was 14, I joined the Roger... Wa- or it was... We, we created the Roger Wagner Chorale. Mm. It was just beginning then. And uh, they took some, the winners of a contest, which I had, I was one of the winners, and they created this chorale, or they, Roger Wagner created this uh, chorale. It was then called the Los Angeles, the Roger Wagner Chorale, and then it became the Los Angeles Master, the Master Chorale. And we then began to sing, um, Oh, with all the New York, with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and then we we then did things in chamber versions, little small little operas when we were ensembles, and we uh, when we were in an ensemble, and then I would do soloists from the ensemble, solo things from the ensemble. <laughs> oh, I'm not making myself clear here, <laughs> but um, it was just a great experience, and that's really how I got into doing a lot of the dubbing itself because they would the studios would call around and say we need some voices and then they would hire us and then I was around the studios and I met a lot of the composers and then gradually then I worked my way into doing some of the solo things that they needed and just uh, being a, a a singer around town that could do almost anything and it was kind of, uh, you know, for a long time it was very lucrative. And while I was still in school, I could do, I could do some jobs, get out of school, 
do my homework on a lot and still be able to uh, do a job. Multitasking at its best. Yes, right. I guess that's what it was. I'm digressing here. Well, no, I think it's fascinating. In fact, would now, would now be a good time to talk about your sort of career in film generally then, would we? Yes. Because um, your first uh, film appearance is 1947 in Oh Susanna, is that right? Well, no, that was not a film. That oh, was, was a that play. Not? Oh, I'm so it sorry. It was a play at the Pasadena Playhouse. It was the life of uh, Susanna Foster, and uh, she was the, she was the person that a lot of the folk songs were written for. So Stephen Foster's wife, I guess. And yes, and uh, so anyway, that was a, a play about that, and and that sort of kept leading to the fact that I really should be totally singing, and I had tried to keep up my violin. Even though I was singing a lot, I thought I could do both. But then that uh, that really started me on my quest to just be a singer. And then um, keep me on track here. I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting too diffused. You started working for MGM uh, quite early on, but in fact as a messenger rather than as a, an actress or a singer. Is that not right? Yes, that's that's correct. I was playing in this student orchestra, and we used to get up. I used to get up from the orchestra and put my violin down and get up and sing arias that had been coached by uh, Charlie Previn, who was the head of Universal Studios at the music department uh, in those days. And he was the uncle of Charlie Previn, mm. by the way. And um, he would coach me on various arias, and then I would be able to get up from the orchestra session and just uh, get up from uh, just put my violin down and stand up and sing an aria and then go back to the violin section <laughs> it was kind of fun so then um Ida Coverman who was Louis B Mayer's secretary who was the head of Louis B Mayer was the head of MGM Studios uh, would come to this orchestra and she heard me get up and sing and she said that I should come to MGM and maybe she could make a start it of me and uh, in the meantime it turns out that she didn't have that there were there were still too many people on the lot who were going to school mm. and there w- wasn't really room for me to have a thorough contract but if i went there as a messenger girl she could see to it that i had voice lessons on my lunch hour and then when somebody wasn't available then maybe i could get into becoming a starlet see if something came up really yes and um, i thought that was great and and it was it was a fun experience but during that time um Bronnie caper who was the composer of lily and uh, a lot of wonderful motion pictures had seen me at the orchestra a lot of the people the the Europeans especially would come to our or- orchestra on Saturday mornings just to see this um, these kids <laughs> <laughs> that were playing and um, they would hire us to do l- extra work and from that it was like a pool of talent you know and so they would hang around and the conductor was European the conductor was Russian by the name of Peter Merenbloom and so they were sort of uh, helping each other Anyway, I had there I was on the MGM lot as a messenger girl, and he had seen me, and he said, "Hey, Nixon, you think that you're so smart? Do you think that you could sing in Hindu?" And I said, "Yes, of course. I mean, <laughs> what did I know?" <laughs> but I thought, "Why not? You know, just tell me how to do it, and I'll do it." And um, so then, on my lunch hour, I went to the recording stage, and there was a Swami there. A, a, an in, a Hindu guy there with with a white turban and white robes, and he taught me the Indian words, and then I recorded them, and they had me sing it in a certain way that I was supposed to be a little bit more babyish than I <laughs> really was, and it turned out to be that it was Margaret O'Brien. It was she was going to be singing a lullaby in the secret secret garden, which I finally saw just the other day. I'd never oh, right. seen the that sequence. How did it look to you? It looked great, and she sang this little lullaby, and uh, that was my first dubbing job, really. And then after that, I decided that I wasn't going to wait around for them to have time to look at me as a starlet, even though I was at MGM and I was having a wonderful time 
sneaking in and watching people do their work, but uh, I I realized then I I didn't really want to just be an actress. I wanted to be a, a total singer, and so then I gave up the messenger job and and started going back to school to to uh, went to city college and then went furthered my studies from that time on and then started singing chamber music and things like that. But that wasn't the end of your dubbing career, was it? When I read your excellent autobiography, by the way, which is called I Could Have Sung All Night, um, I, Thank was, you. I was fascinated to discover that you uh, collaborated with and partially dubbed Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, usually associated with Marilyn Monroe. Yes, well, I didn't really sing the whole thing. I just did a few measures on the top. She, it was mostly her, and I never met her. I just came in and listened to her voice, and she had done it, and they really didn't like the way she sounded when she did the high portions of that. So I just they would just gradually insert my voice for the higher parts, but the whole but it wasn't totally me at all. Just it was just I even forgot about it till people started asking, well, who else, who else did you do dubbing for? And I mentioned that, and everybody finds that so interesting. <laughs> then I conjured that up. <laughs> it's, um, I think the line, um, when they're square cut or pear shape, the, those rocks don't mm-hmm. lose their shape, is, is you on the soundtrack, is that right? Yes, that's it. Yeah. So I think I think we'll all now be listening to that song again with with particularly sharp ears. <laughs> well, I hope you don't even you don't notice a difference at all. So that's the whole point in dubbing that it sounds like the person, of course. So I don't mind telling you that one of the huge I mean, forgive me, you seem to have so many skills and so many talents, but one of the ones that I think amazes everyone and why everyone will always be interested in you is your ability to be like a chameleon when you are performing for other people. I mean, you've played some tremendously different roles. I delight in talking about them. Maybe we should start with uh, Deborah, uh, Deborah Carr and The King and I in, in 1955. Sure, yes. You developed a, a very interesting and, and closely knit collaborative working pattern with Deborah Carr, I think. Yes, it was, um, it was kind of like... Um, you know, we really didn't know what we were going to do ahead of time, but we, we developed a system that seemed logical, and we were assisted by the wonderful uh, uh, vocal director, Ken Darby, who was really uh, kind of guiding us through the process. And so what we discovered was that I would come into the studio and just uh, learn the songs. She would uh, also learn them separately at a, at a separate time, and then we would come together, and she would start singing for me. She would then tell me what was going on in the situation, in the, in the scene, and uh, how she was feeling about the song. And then they taped the the whole periphery of the set onto the the rehearsal room floor, so we had the right dimensions and and the space between the furniture and how she was going to stage the song. And then she began singing it within that set, and then I would stand up right next to her, and she would take from me the energy that it took to to sing certain things and my mouth movements and everything, and then I would take from her, and we would be singing at the same time, you see. I would take from her the kind of... I would imagine what my voice would... To, to sound like her, what I had to do to kind of manipulate the inside of my mouth to g- make that sound. I think I became a very good teacher later on just because I was kind of <laughs> imagining what different sounds you could make by manipulating sometimes the cavities and the resonances and things. And uh, Teaching yourself, really. Yeah, and, th- and then uh, sort of, of course, had to use her own diction. I had to use her British diction, which she said for that picture was not really true British, but it was mid-Atlantic, which was a term that she used. I don't know whether that's a, a standard term or not, but it was like, it was. I thought it was very funny because she said it's sort of halfway between you know, England and America. A happy marriage of the two accents. Yes, right. <laughs> so um, anyway, then then I would really be able to know what she wanted to do emotionally in the song and what she thought about all the image and the subtext and everything. 
and then I would u- try to use her pronunciation and her lip movement and try to get her sound as much as possible. And then she would go to the sound stage with me and uh, watch me while I was then recording the songs. And then she would get up afterwards and sing them through her own, uh, sing at the same time and making sure that she could, you know, that, that it was all just the way she would think that she would proceed in the actual scene. Then she would go to the actual shooting of the film and then she had to mouth to that track and she had to be right on while she was filming she had to be mouthing or actually you have to be singing yourself it isn't just mouthing she would have to really sing but had to be just precisely in the timing that as we had recorded it because your lips you they just have to be right right on top of it not not a second afterwards or anything or it looks fake and uh, But it was also kind of ingrained by the time we got there, and it was a wonderful way of doing it. It took about a, a week per song. And it's not as though that, that character doesn't have lots of songs, is it, <laughs> Anna in The King and I? <laughs> well, she has... Um, there were six songs, so it, it took about six weeks, actually, to do the whole thing. I, I really like the idea that what you're explaining there, that, um, that you were learning from her how the character would react for your singing, and then she was learning from you the technique that you would be using for singing, so that she could... Yes. And she was looking at me physically as I was singing, and I was looking at her physically while she was singing, so that I could, I could kind of... Uh, you know, get her her physical set up also. I think that's an absolutely fascinating way of working. Uh, were you happy with the final result? Oh, yes, I was very happy with it. And uh, and she was, and I think the studio was too. They were not happy with the fact that uh, she herself gave me credit for doing <laughs> the dubbing. Well, I wanted to talk about that, of course, because it was all strictly on the never-never, wasn't it, in the sense that you weren't supposed to be known. Right. And uh, indeed, I think you, you got a threatening telephone call, is that right? Yes, they called me from the, uh, from the publici- publicity office and they said that if anyone ever found out that I did any part of the dubbing for her, that they would see to it that I would never work in town again. Which is outrageous. It's awful. <laughs> it sounds like a, the mafia or something, you know. <laughs> well, my, and, my blood ran cold when I read it, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was terrified, of course, because in those days I really, I really had to make that living. I was doing a lot of classical things, but then it was very, uh, at that point I was doing a lot of esoteric things with Stravinsky and Schoenberg and things which were very important to me. That was what I thought my major career was. And I was, but I need, I had um, a couple of children by that point, and, and my husband had not become well known to get really good jobs as a composer. He was Ernest Gold, wasn't he, the, the Hollywood film uh, composer? And he hadn't done Exodus yet, and, and so he was still involved in doing like, D and B movies and and sometimes you just sometimes you don't work and sometimes you do and and here we had two kids and and so that I was I had we had decided that I would work as much as possible because I loved working and uh, he could he could stay at home and and be a a, a father or a, what is it called a, a home a home home father or something. <laughs> a uh, homemaker, during the, yes. Yes, the, the, while I was uh, out working and it, until he got so that we could afford to have help and stuff. So it was like I was a very... It was not good to hear that they were going to try to boycott me working like that. <laughs> but, but Deborah Carr had her own ideas, really, I think. <laughs> yeah, she was very gracious and wonderful. Well, she did say that I had just done the high notes. She didn't say I did everything, but <laughs> anyway, it didn't matter. <laughs> and but she was, she, she was happy for you to have the credit. Yes, she was, she was really happy, and it, she had no ego problem with that. And indeed, when I was... Um, Going, when I was writing my memoirs, and just before the deadline to get permission to use various uh, photographs that I had, um, I had not heard from her. And um, 
something told me that that I could find her and that she would give me permission to use the the picture. The fo- the uh, studio said, well, even though we took the the photo, we, we can't do it without her permission to have it uh, put in a book, which is crazy. But anyway. Um, and they had more power than me, so I had to assume that that was going to be true. But I kept trying to figure out, and it was it's like magic. A lot, a lot of things happened to me that I think are magic anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they, I was at a party, and somebody said, oh, well, I know where she is, and, uh, and I have a good friend, and he, she gave me the address of where she had been in Switzerland. And so I wired her and it was actually and I guess it was no I think I FedExed her or something anyway it was that it was the FedEx company that then got a referral and found her in England in her uh, hometown got uh, finally made contact with her and uh it took a long time, but it was it was just incredible. And then I heard not from her, but from her housekeeper or a nurse, because she was then um, she was she could understand everything, but she couldn't speak. I guess mm-hmm. she had Parkinson's, and it was too hard for her to speak. But she, I got the message from this person that that Deborah Carr would indeed give me permission to have this photograph in the book, and. Um, and that she admired me a great deal and good luck. And I mean, just such a gracious lady. It was fantastic. Well, I was going to say how lovely. I mean, you've also put that lovely story in that when you were actually working with her on The King and I, that she used to pick you up in her sort of um, actress limousine, shall we say? No, that was Audrey Hepburn. Oh, in which case, I'm so sorry, I've, I've mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I get it mixed up sometimes, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, it. It's, uh, yeah, Audrey Hepburn, you, th- that on My Fair Lady, used to pick me up in her limo. But I would drive myself to the 20th Century Fox lot and, and when I was doing The King and I. Now, your next sort of major dubbing was for Natalie Wood, of course, in the film version of West Side Story. Now, Maria's a very different character again. Um, yes. And, but the, the way it ended up you dealing with that one was quite, quite different, wasn't it, in style? I don't, I don't think you worked at all closely with Natalie Wood, if at all. Yes, it was very frightening. It was hard to do because she didn't want to be dubbed. Mm. She didn't really accept it like Deborah had. I mean, Deborah knew that she had to be dubbed, and she was trying to get the best you know, the best out of me. It was a real good cooperation. With Natalie, she just, she refused to have me present in her voice lessons or coaching sessions, which is a wonderful way to be able to get acquainted with the voice, is to sit in the background and see how they react and everything. But she wouldn't, uh, she was too insecure and wouldn't do that, except that luckily the, um, the coach, Bobby Tucker, took a recording of all of their sessions and so that then after she left, then he could call me and he could play uh, and translate, you know, what went on and then I could just give him, listen to that and then give him, for instance, you know, and say, does it, does this sound like it or that? So we would just experiment, but without her being there. And then when she it got to the point of recording, they had us both there at the recording session. And they said that she was going to record the whole song herself with the orchestra. And then after she did that, then I was to then to record it. And then they were going to combine those takes electronically well in a live performance like that you know that's not really possible and technically it's not good but i i thought well maybe they know something i don't know but it turned out that of course what they were doing was just placating her because she didn't want to be dubbed so she recorded her track and she then mouthed to her own track when she filmed the picture and then after the picture was all recorded and she had every bit of, as they said, they, they had all her puss in the can, <laughs> <laughs> which is sort of naughty. But uh, then they told her that her voice was going to be taken out and, some, and that I was going to be laying my voice in. I had been around there and she knew me, but she, she thought it was 
ostensibly just to do like a few high notes. Mm. That must be awkward for you, of course. It was very awkward, and uh, also because the orchestra were most of the orchestra were my friends. They were the musicians in Los Angeles are spectacular, and they're all sort of part of the symphony orchestra of, of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and and yet they're playing in the studios too, you know. So you have a high quality of musicians in the studio, and but they're kind of not necessarily. They can't be told. They can't be regulated how to behave. Yes, <laughs> evidently, <laughs> they are their own masters. Yes. <laughs> yes, right. They're their own masters, and so when Deborah Carr would be recording, they played. You know, they knew it was being recorded, but then. When I got up and recorded the same thing afterwards, they would just sit up in their chairs and really play like crazy, you know, with with a great intensity. <laughs> and they would applaud, and it was rather embarrassing because she was there too. But anyway, it was it was kind of interesting. And then afterwards, after she filmed everything, then they told her that all of her tracks were going to be taken out and they were going to insert mine, but there was nothing she could do about it. Now, when you say insert yours, bearing in mind that she'd been dubbing, uh, she'd been miming to her own soundtrack, did that involve you having to re-record again? Yes. Was it the looping system, wasn't it? Yes, then I had to come back. I mean, this is sort of backwards. You had I had to come back and then to earphones and seeing the picture on the screen, I then had to dub my voice into the film. And the, the problem, it was there was a great problem because it was interesting since Robert Wise, the director, knew that he, he hadn't told anybody this, but he knew that her voice is going to not be used. He didn't have her precisely in sync with the track, even her own track. Oh, really? So her lips at some point were not really rhythmically with the track. And I don't know how they or why they did that, but I, I suspect that it was because they thought, oh, well, it's going to be redubbed and it doesn't matter or something. Or maybe she they didn't want to tip the <laughs> scale or they didn't want to spend the time or whatever. Or the money, so that then, <laughs> So that then when I came back to do the dubbing, there she was singing to the track, which was always there, but the... But the but the orchestra track she wasn't her lips weren't with it mm. sometimes so I had to kind of fix that up so finessing it really at the end and yes and so that on the uh, on the long shots I could be you couldn't see her lips that clearly I could be right with the orchestra and then on the close ups if she was turning a little bit to the side I could be with the orchestra and be right on time but if she was right dead on i had to really be mostly with her lips which were you know not really entirely in sync with the orchestra which was uh, kind of a hard job to kind of and then i hedged it a little bit but it it turned out just fine well it looks very fine and of course west side story is a, a very popular film to this day yes yes it is i'd like to say also in the song one hand one heart yes is it right that you you it, the emotion in that for you because obviously you act you aren't just singing you are acting as you sing and i think that's a very important thing to bring to the fore you actually were crying as you sang it well yes and because of the situation and dramatically i think that's that's what i don't know i was just involved in it somehow when you're not performing when i perform and i feel like tears are coming as i'm performing you can kind of remove yourself a little bit so you're not involved in your own motions because your your tone has to be produced with a tone and when you start to cry you can't really sing especially in you know an operatic range or anything so that i guess because i could be a little bit removed i could i could i i was then not using that discipline and so i would constantly be breaking down and i would have to stop recording and and do it again and sort of not get into the emotion so that i could really do the singing so it was it was kind of difficult but i wanted the feeling that because she was i mean it's a very emotional scene mm, very <laughs> and i i wanted that feeling in the voice so so i had to learn to kind of you know sing through a voice that was almost crying, and it was it was a nice effect. I think it turned out quite well. It, it certainly did. I mean, um, 
forgive me. I mean, it, I think your work in that film is, you know, make, helps make it the masterpiece that it is. Oh, good. Well, very definitely. And as I say, I think it keeps bringing us back to this point that you're so much more than a singer. I mean, that's clearly uh, a huge skill in its own right. But on top of that, you are able to get the emotion across, the, the feeling and the character, which is um, so impressive. Uh, particularly, if I may say, because I know that you also dubbed small amounts of Rita Marino in West Side Story yes. as well, as Anita. A different <laughs> yeah. character again, rather. That was that was kind of fun. I had to kind of color my voice to make it sound like her voice, which is a different timbre than than uh, Natalie Woods. And um, the dubber, Betty Wand, uh, uh, had a cold the day that they were recording Rita's things, and uh, so did Rita herself. And so finally... Uh, they said to me, well, Marnie, you just, why don't you do both parts? Doesn't <laughs> matter. So, so that was a kind of an improv. It, that worked out okay. That was fun. <laughs> It's it's good it's good that you had um, so much of an influence in this film, and you got a credit on the sound recording. I think is that right? Not the film, but the the, the, the release of the soundtrack. They they of course get, didn't give me credit on the film. No, um, but I think yeah, that I think maybe you know I've forgotten. Maybe maybe it says in my book. I've forgotten the details there, but but I know that I was trying to. I don't think I ever really got credit except when people just mention my name now more and more because the subject of dubbing had become much more prominent. But I, I was able to get some um, royalties from the soundtrack. Some kind of consolation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was nice because um, I had sung with uh, Leonard Bernstein with the New York Philharmonic. I'd done a lot of uh, things by that time, and I considered him, you know, a, a friend. And... When I insisted to, was going to, I wanted to get some kind of royalty on the soundtrack, which had never happened in Hollywood before. I don't think they were willing to, to they didn't want to do that because it was kind of setting a precedence. And they said, and it was true, that they had given away all the, uh, all the percentages. There was no more money to give. And um, so I just stood my ground, and I just <laughs> said, "Well, you you fix up," which was which was uh, which was fun. They used they used that against me. Then <laughs> afterwards, when I if something would go wrong, they would say, "Well, you fix up." <laughs> anyway, um, the fact was that I stood my ground so courageously, I guess, and. Uh, Leonard Bernstein then gave up a quarter percentage of his uh, percentage that he was going to get so that I could get a percentage for the dubbing. Which is good of him, but as it should be. <laughs> oh, well, it was really good of him. I mean, I thought it was spectacular. And that kind of set a precedence. So. What, what was Leonard Bernstein like? Because, as you say, you worked with him um, in, on operatic circles as well. Well, we did a lot of symphony concerts together with the New York Philharmonic. I did... Uh, the uh, Improvisation sur Malarmé by uh, Pierre Boulez, which is a very contemporary piece. Uh, I had done some recordings with that and uh, had, had uh, premiered that here in New York City with the New York Philharmonic. And then I had done the uh, Young People's Concerts, which he had uh, taped, which still you can see they were taped from... Carnegie Hall, the young people's concerts were uh, music that then he would he would talk to the audience. He would turn around to the audience, and it was mainly for for kids, you know, describing what a piece was like. It was all for young people, and he would do sections of pieces and describe them. It was a most fantastic thing, and they're now uh, filmed and they they're in the archives, and you can see that the, those shows. Anyway, I I had known, um, so we had been fairly acquainted because of those performances. So then when I went back to do the dubbing, then and, and I said to them, well, you fix up. I guess <laughs> then they went to Bernstein, and he was gracious, gracious enough. I never really talked to him about that particularly, but uh, he gave up a quarter percentage so I could set a... I could get a percentage and that set a precedent so I could then, any future dollars, I could say, I get a percentage, this is what I get, you know. <laughs> mm. 
musical talk. There we have it, the first part of my interview with Marnie Nixon, which was recorded in April 2010, just a few weeks after her 80th birthday. And you could hear the vivacity in her voice. And that's my overriding memory of her. Do tune in again to next week's episode and we'll hear the remainder of that interview, which I hope you'll find as engaging and as interesting as I have listening to it again. But until that point, it's time to say goodbye. So, very simply, goodbye. This episode of Musical Talk edited and presented by Thos Ribbits. The sound engineering on the interview with Marnie Nixon was by Tim Saywood. Copyright Musical Talk 2016. Except for the songs where the copyright remains with the original creators. And my thanks go to them for allowing me to play those two songs in this episode. To find out more about the world of musical talk and listen to past episodes, go along to our brand new website, musicaltalkpodcast.weebly.com or subscribe to us on iTunes and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can at musicaltalkthos.com.